Mark chapter 14, as I, I want to share a message with you this morning that I believe is very important to us. Mark chapter 14. Let me help you get the setting for this. Jesus is on a walk right now. He's walking away from Jerusalem. It's evening time. He's walking down the hill over around the Mount of Olives to a small village called Bethany. He had already triumphantly entered into Jerusalem. People had palm branches. They said, Hosanna in the highest. Son of David, save us now. And uh, as he entered in, he had cursed the fig tree because it bore no fruit. Israel wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And he went into the heart of Israel, into the temple. And he began to turn over the money changers and make a whip to drive out the animals. He said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. It should be a house of prayer. And then the scribes and Pharisees came and they tried to trick him with theological questions. How foolish is that? They didn't know the answers. They couldn't handle his responses and the questions he then asked them and said they were lost. And Jesus began to teach and instruct his 12 and instruct the people there. And then as night drew nigh, he began to walk. They took a two-mile walk into Bethany, a small village outside of Jerusalem. And they came to a house that's known as Simon the leper's house. Now, I don't know about you, but you don't go into a man's house that's called Simon the leper. That is not a place you want to visit. Unless the man was cured of leprosy, and we would believe he was by Jesus, because he wouldn't be allowed in a village if he was a leper. And so he resumed his residence in his house, and he invited Jesus and the disciples in. This was a planned meeting for them to come and rest. It was two days before Passover now, and Jesus knew what he needed to prepare for. And so they walk into that house, and they're seated. And as they're seated there around the table, they begin to have discussion. And guess who else is there? Not only is Simon the leper, who it's enough to see him and rejoice that he had been cleansed from his leprosy, but Mary and Martha are there as well. And so is their brother Lazarus, who was risen from the dead just the week previously than that. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to have dinner with a guy like that? What did you see? What did you hear? What was it like? You know, and so Lazarus is there, Mary and Martha, and Martha's serving them as usual. And they're sitting around the table. And we don't know where Mary is at at the moment, but we're having conversation. It's getting to be evening time. The candles are lit. It's getting to be cooler. And there's a quietness and a hush before what's going to take place in the next couple of days. So as they're sitting there, Mary comes into the room. And Mary has in her hand an alabaster flask. And as she approaches Jesus, you would think that she would uncork it, unseal it, but it says that she crushes the alabaster uh, flask. Why would you crush something that you can open? She crushed it so that it could never be closed again, so that what was coming out of it would never be put back. She had committed this unto Jesus. And as she crushed it into her hands, I don't know if she took something to smash it in her hands or if she literally broke it in her hands at risk of being cut herself. She smashed it, crushed it, it says. In the word uh, for break, in the Greek, it literally means to demolish. And, and she takes this, this nard, this uh, ointment that is so fragrant, and she begins to pour it over the head of Jesus. In the other gospel accounts, it says she pours it on his feet as well. And so she begins to anoint him and cover him in the sweet fragrance of nard. Now, it's costly. This stuff's costly. Somewhere between $1,500, $2,000, a year's wages, it says in the scriptures. This woman had saved up. This was her dowry. This This was priceless. But she took it and broke it so that she could offer it to Jesus, her master. And as she pours that out and breaks it, crushes it, it says that the disciples were angry and scolded her. They yelled at her. In fact, the one who was indignant and spoke out the loudest, it says in Matthew and in the book of John, it says that Judas spoke up. And he chides her. And he's angry. And the word for scolding her in the Greek that it says he scolded her, the word for for the Greek is he's very angry, he's indignant to the anger of snorting like a horse. I don't know if you've been around someone that snorts like a horse, but when they're angry, you don't want to be near them. 
He's that vehemently angry that she would waste this. And he says, why would you waste this? We could have sold this to get money so that we could have helped the poor. But in John's gospel, he says that Judas had a different motivation. In John's gospel, it says in John 12, 6, John gives us a little commentary and says that the reason Judas said this was not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You see, this is what happens when an expression of love to God is freely given and poured out an exuberant expression, something beyond the norm to where maybe we would shout, maybe we would sing, maybe we'd lift our hands, maybe we would pour something out that's expensive to us. When there's an expression of love to God, it reveals the heart of everyone in the room. This great expression of love revealed the heart, the true heart of Judas. He couldn't stand to see this anointing take place. It's the same as what happened with Pharaoh. His heart got hardened when God wanted to show grace on Israel. The slaves in, Is- in Egypt, sorry. The slaves in Egypt, when God wanted to sh- give grace to Israel as their slaves in Egypt, the Pharaoh got hardened and hardened and madder when God would show his love to Israel. Judas was angry and chided her that she would spend the money. Can you believe That this woman would give all that she had as an expression of love. She poured it out. Jesus responds. Now Jesus has yelled at his disciples before as any rabbi uh, teaching and chiding his, his followers to get correct. You remember in the boat on the waters, how long must I be with you, men of little faith? Come on, get with it boys, right? Ah, this one must be cast out with prayer and fasting. But this time I think there was a strength and a depth to Jesus' response. As Judas is, is angry and yelling at Mary. It's interesting, why? Why does he feel so comfortable in this house to be able to just angrily speak out against someone doing something for Jesus? I mean, who does he think he is, really? Some speculate that Simon the leper might be Simon Iscariot. Judas is the son, John tells us, of Simon Iscariot. Could Simon the leper be Judas' father? Could it be that they're in Simon the leper's house, which is Judas's house? That's pure speculation. We don't know. But why the boldness? Why does he stand up? See, something's agitating Judas. Something's stirring in Judas. And if you look in verse 10, it says, after this experience, Judas leaves the house to go betray Jesus. Something breaks. It's not only an alabaster box that breaks in that house, but so does the enemy. Something snaps. You see, there is a time when an anointing is breaking forth that when there's an anointing that breaks forth, all hell breaks loose. There are times when there's a move of God so strong that that move of God permeates the house. Consider this, that while she's breaking that alabaster jar and that fragrance is filling the room, there's a beautiful smell in the room, but there's something ugly rising up. That can happen. A revelation of Jesus can do that. He's either something of a sweet fragrance to you or something you abhor. It begins to draw lines to determine who's for him and who's against him. And when that fragrance began to fill the air and everybody had the benefit of it, those resisted and began to yell at her. And Jesus responds back quickly, leave her alone! And he shuts Judas down. And he says, why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And I was captured by that word in the English Standard Version, a beautiful thing. King James says, a good thing. Some of the other translations says, she's done well by me. She's done a good thing. But the ESV is the closest to the Greek. She's done a beautiful thing. That is something that has value. That is something that is perfect, gorgeous, well-designed, rightly put. She did this beautifully. 
She did something beautiful to me. For you always have the poor with you, and wherever and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. You see, there's an anointing. There's a, there's a, a, a moment here, if I can use it. There's a punctiliar moment. That's a punctuated moment right here in the realm of the Spirit. This is when it all breaks loose. This is when Satan begins to draw Judas to betray him, to go to the Pharisees, Sadducees. This is when Jesus is turning from obediently doing the will of God, speaking the will of God, to now passively obeying the will of God by no longer speaking, no longer acting, but becoming that lamb led to the slaughter. He was now anointed. You've got to understand what's in the air. It's palpable. You begin to smell it. You, you begin to feel it invade you. And there's, there's a spiritual war going on. And, and Judas is snorting and muttering and, and speaking. And Jesus is rebuking. This is a moment of the anointing of my death. They don't know what to do with it. They just don't know what to do with it. It's a different fragrance. You know, the death of Jesus is just that way. It's a stumbling block to those who are wise. Those who seek wisdom. The cross is foolishness. It doesn't make sense. This God that would die. Come on. We're intellectual people. This is 2015, right? We're scientifically enlightened. Our world is so far better off with the scientific mind. We're geniuses, aren't we? When in fact all we've really created are greater weapons to kill each other with. The heart of man's never changed. For as smart as we think we are, and as foolish as we think the cross is, it's the only answer that is the wisdom of God. Jews are looking for a sign. It's an offensive sign to say that God would be a man. The Ein Sof, the incomprehensible one. How could he become a man? Come on. That offends me. And then you hang him on a tree. A tree. You, you Christians drive me nuts. You put a dead man on a tree, bleeding and wounded, and you all go, oh, this is great. What, are you crazy? Why is that beautiful to you? Because it reminds me of what should be done to me, but he stood in my place. It reminds me of a grace of a God so wonderful, so amazing, that he himself would take my punishment for his law and take his judgment upon himself to free me from my eternal punishment. I'll praise that cross all day long. It is wisdom. It is a sign. It is a symbol. And so it's breaking forth at this moment. This alabaster jar represents the breaking forth of an anointing of time and season that's going to change everything. To some it's a sweet fragrance. To other, it's a nuisance. It says in 2 Corinthians 15 that we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma of from death to death, and to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? You see, there's an aroma to God. The world is dying. This world is under the curse of death, but to the believer, we have an aroma of life, the resurrected power life of Christ Jesus. It's an awesome, awesome thing. We've become that breaking of the alabaster box. It's a moment that sets the course of the next few days where now Judas betrays Jesus. Jesus will now go forth and be prepared for the Passover meal, and then to be arrested. I want you to see what Jesus also says about Mary in verse 9. He says this, And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Wow. That's amazing. You couldn't take out advertising for $1,500 or $2,000 to have something last 2,015 years. It wasn't the price of money. It wasn't the cost of something so precious to her. She poured out her love for Christ. And he said, that will be forever remembered. 
What matters in your life is not how much money you've saved. Not how, how much money you've even given to the church. None of that is as is important as how much of your heart was given to Christ. How much have you broken the alabaster box of your heart to be broken out in love to Christ? Oh, God bless you for giving ten bucks, a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks in the offering. God bless you for that. May it be used to His glory. But what He wants more than any of that is your heart, your love. He wants all of you. The Bible says that we're earthen jars, clay jars that holds something so precious, the very Spirit of God. But it's got to be broken. It's got to be crushed. He doesn't want you to take the top off on Sundays and Wednesdays. Wednesdays, pour a little out for Jesus. Put the topper back on and put it on your shelf of self-concern and self-interest. He wants you to do what Mary did. Bust it. So it'll never return back. You'll never withhold again. You'll pour your heart out for Christ and Christ alone. That's why we get excited here. We bought a building so we could shout to God and praise Him and not feel inhibited. Well, I want to tell you, we need to do it beyond the walls of this building and out into our workplace and in our neighborhood and be that fragrance of Christ. But I want to tell you, whenever you will be, you will offend some. Can I tell you who you will usually offend? The religious folks. The Judas, those who, uh, this is a little bit too much for me. This is a little bit uh, uh, freakish. This is a little bit cultish. You guys talking about Jesus, this and that. But go wings. Huh? Go blue. Right? We'll shout, we'll paint our faces, we'll get in line, we'll stand for hours. But let's just keep it down about Jesus. Break the jar. Break it open. Break it open. I I, I love what uh, Vance Havner says about the broken jar. He says this, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop. It takes broken clouds for the rain to fall. It takes broken grain to give bread. It takes broken bread to give strength. And it is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. It is Peter, weeping bitterly, who returns to greater power than ever. You want to be used of God? You need to be broken. You see, there is a time... When there is a breaking that comes forth. And when that breaking comes forth, you come into a new level. Something that breaks. You see, you contained it before, but now you can't contain it. Some of you are looking for a greater anointing, a greater level in God, but He can't do it till He breaks off the restrictions you've put on Him. The restraints we've put on God. Let's keep them in a box, shall we? Let's keep them a little bit under control, shall we? How can you do this when you know the meaning of life? You know the author of life. You know the true love of God that's been poured into your heart. How can we contain this? How can we live a life unto ourselves? See, here's the problem, everybody. The alabaster box is us. The perfume and the fragrance is Him in us. Why and how is it we care more about the container than what we contain? It isn't right. Think of other things that God broke. How many of you remember when God by his own finger wrote the Ten Commandments and he gave them to Moses? Moses comes down the hill. There it is, the covenant of God with the nation of Israel. He called them out. They made it out. They made it through the Red Sea, made it through the desert. They're at Mount Sinai. Here you go. I'm your God. You're my people. And what are they doing? They're worshiping a golden cow. Moses is so ticked, he breaks those commandments. And that is a prophetic image of what Israel's going to continue to do 
over and over and over for a thousand years, they're going to continue to break his commandments, break his commandments, break his heart, break his heart, break his heart. But Moses goes back and God writes another tablet and Moses writes it down and it tells us what the story is all about, that God is not about writing rules on stone. It's his goal and purpose to bring Messiah to write his law on our hearts. But how many of you know in order to come to Christ, you've got to break open the container? How many of you know that to come to Christ, you had to be broken? You realized that you were a sinner. And the hammer of God's word came down on you and broke your heart. You thought you were all that. Oh, you're beautiful. You're very special. But in reality, without Christ, we are all doomed to hell. And that breaks us. But when we're broken, we recognize there's the fragrance of a Savior here for us. A Redeemer who's going to redeem our life and change us. He's going to break us open and we'll be like a flame. When Joshua came against the Midianites, he had an army of just 300. And they had these great torches that were lit, but they put a jar, clay jar over them so that as they snuck up on the enemy's camp, all at once they were supposed to scream and smash open that, that container and all the lights would come on. It's the first light show. This is awesome military tactics. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere in the darkness, the Midianites look and there's a flame of fire round about them as all the army shouts. It's just 300 guys. But it's the fire that's loosed in the darkness to scare the enemy. That was you. He broke open your heart so that he could be a fire that burns within. Oh, what God can do with a broken life. He says in uh, Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. God has to break our hearts. That's what took place in that room that night. Something of divine proportions took place in the evening of Simon the leper's house and it drew a line between those who were for Christ and those against Christ. Where are you at in all of this? Uh, I, I conclude with this. When God talks about this kind of release of worship and praise, Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 2.15. He says this, But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, And he uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're that aroma. Our lives broken so that we would be the sweet aroma for the Lord. And Paul was giving an illustration of a triumphal entry of Christ. The glory of the Lord coming in a conquest a finished battle. We're His fragrance and we're in a great parade. The parade is us being crushed in the fragrance for Christ. You see, what would happen in in this time period is this, that when the army would return back to the city in victory, the people would go out to meet the army. And as they would go out, they had flower petals, and they would sprinkle on the road all the flower petals uh, uh, from fragrant flowers. And as the army would ride their horses over, crushing the petals beneath them and all the flowers beneath them, it would bring forth a pleasant aroma, the sweet smell of the fragrance of flowers, a triumphant parade That the fragrance of those who had given themselves are the fragrance of its victory. You're the fragrance of Christ. Have you been broken for Him? Something special in my heart this morning that I think of. I've never experienced anything like this till I was in Pakistan. When I was in Pakistan, they said, Pastor, we want to honor you. 
And they put a a lay of flowers around me, these beautiful pink and red, vibrant flowers. The fragrance was in my nostrils at all times. Ron and I, as we were walking towards the church, we began to feel petals fall on our heads. And we looked up and, and the kids and the children, they were so happy that Christians from America were here and they began to throw flower petals on us. We were walking on them and having them arrayed in us. You could smell the sweet fragrance of this wonderful parade for Jesus as we had our own little triumphal entry there to share that love. I think of this. And I think of this morning, how there were two bombs set in Pakistan against two churches to kill and destroy these believers. Fourteen dead, many wounded, two churches destroyed by suicide bombers in Pakistan today. You can count on tomorrow, the Pakistan Christians will be taking the streets As you heard Pastor Quentin, who was here just a few weeks ago, months ago, when we asked him, why would you do that? Why would you go to the streets when they're bombing your churches? And he looked at me puzzled when I asked him that question. You saw his face. He said, who else will go? It's what we do. Who will speak for those who gave their lives? You see the sweet aroma of the Christian is you can't stop this love even when it's crushed, its fragrance blossoms. The love of Jesus will not be stopped no matter what men do, no matter what Judas's say, and no matter how they plan to crush and destroy Jesus, he will rise and his people will rise and the fragrance of grace will rise in this earth and love people. This is the story of the church. This is the story of our lives. Crushed and broken, you've already given yourself to him. Be that fragrance. Let us bow our heads as we commit ourselves to him.